everyone. So this talk is on calcaneal fractures, but specifically the sinus tarsi approach. My name is Lynn Mason. I am a uh, consultant for ankle surgeon and trauma surgeon in uh, Liverpool in the UK. So first of all, let's talk about the evolution. This is not the start of people using the sinus tarsi approach for calcaneal fractures, but certainly where it took off. So in the UK, uh, this was published back in 2014, Calcaneal fractures surgery provides no benefits. This was the front cover of the BMJ, uh, which is uh, quite misleading that no calcaneal fracture required surgery. They were reporting on a randomized control trial called the heel fracture trial, where they, uh, there was no difference at two years between operative and non-operative treatment for calcaneal fractures. On the surface of it, uh, it appeared that uh, it didn't matter if you had standards two or standards three or four fractures, uh, you didn't require surgery. However, not, a, not many fractures were actually included. So of these fractures you can see here, none of these would have been included in the, um, uh, this heel fracture trial. They're quite restrictive of the inclusion. This year they reported on the uh, 60 months following uh, fractures being sustained. And as you can see that, that uh, they have remained on the function scores no different. But as you can see, the standards three and four, even in the uh, fractures that weren't treated uh, with surgery, remained this quite similar to those of standards two. So you had very complex fractures not functionally being impaired. Back in uh, um, 2018, a publication from Cambridge looked at, did this make a difference in the UK? So the publication on this, and it didn't see that there was any change in the number of fractures and the known fixation following the publication of this. What did change was the way that they were being uh, uh, undertaken with surgery, because we had this increase in those undergoing close reduction and minimal incision surgery. This is a paper by uh, Stefan Rommel uh, from Dresden. And uh, just this quote really does sum up. The poorest treatment results are reported after open surgical treatment that failed to achieve anatomical reduction of the calcaneum. That's combining disadvantages of both operative and non-operative treatment. The crucial question really is not only whether we should operate, but how we should operate and who should do it. This is what we're trying to avoid because these are devastating injuries, very difficult to treat, and the patient's function is uh, very poor. So what are we trying to achieve? We're trying to achieve the restoration of its function, uh, subtalar motion, ankle motion, painless heel to toe gait, the voids of deformity, heel height, to prevent the various uh, valgus malunion, and then normal shoe width, so we reduce the heel width. But this is a balance, because with every surgery, there's a risk. The risk involved with calcaneal fractures with the extended lateral approach, which was done in the heel fracture trial, the wound complications uh, were undergoing RF uh, was up to 17% in this paper out of 490 operations. There were uh, some factors which uh, increased this rate of infection, such as more people in the operating room, duration of surgery, estimated blood loss, tourniquet use. This paper from Amsterdam shows they had a 24.6% uh, infection. Remember this, because we're going to talk about this later. And the uh, ASA classification and cross suction drain seem to improve this. Uh, this paper, which is a meta-analysis, showed 21% had a post-operative infection under 1,651. So one fifth of patients undergoing surgery had a post-operative infection. And this is obviously going to significantly affect the functional outcomes. So what's the alternatives? So uh, to return to those of Amsterdam, this was, uh, as you recall, a 24% uh, had an infection in the initial series. Out of these 237 undergoing surgery through a uh, sinus tarsi approach, this reduced to uh, 6%, uh, which is an increased rate in those undergoing surgery less than seven days, high operative time, and a higher ASA grades. There's been seven systematic reviews now in meta analysis, including uh, one network of meta analysis. And through these, the most significant finding is that if you compare the sinus tarsi approach to the uh, extended lateral approach, we have a significant uh, improvement in the complication rate, uh, for especially wound complications, down to around 4% from 25%. And 
but there's no difference in any other radiological parameters and the sinus tasks also reduced the operative times. Uh, to give an example, uh, as you can see by this um, forest plot, there is a significant favoring across all the studies. Technique. So what we're trying to do is restore the calcaneal shapes, the height, various valgus, anterior process, and heal width, and then restore the joint surface. So first of all, two tuberosity position. So you can see this, uh, the tuberosity is both elevated, you've got a loss of bolus angle, and it's also in various. Uh, some people use a shunt spin. I do this uh, from time to time, often using an X fix pin from the Hoffman set rather than the shunt spin. Uh, but what I do most often is to put a frame on uh, to get the various valgus. And you can see this, uh, you've got a wire through the talus, a wire 90 degrees to the uh, calcaneal tuberosity. And you can see this is coming into a convergence. And by distracting this, this gets you out of that various position and could obtain length. So I've tried this a number of ways. Uh, these are a few ways you can do it. So this is a, do it with a fine wire frame. So the wire has been placed uh, through the calcaneum 90 degrees. I put on a, a small frame, uh, two 160 uh, three quarter rings uh, with tension wires. And then we've got three bars that have been placed and this allows you in uh, three degrees of movement. And you can see that this distracts. The problem with this, it's quite difficult to get to that approach to get the joint surface up. And there's me using a scissors uh, that I used to use, but I tend to use more of a, a chisel nowadays to elevate that joint surface. And then the joint can be uh, approached and repaired. You can see that we are out of that various position uh, with the use of this frame. And then the, these wires, uh, these screws are being placed along the tuberosity to uh, keep its final position, fully threaded screws, uh, not compression screws. Uh, this is uh, the use of one of the frames. You can see this heel is in valgus. I do this in a prone position. We've got a pin in the uh, tibia, uh, a pin going all the way through the uh, tailor head, and a pin going all the way through the calcaneum. This achieves its length, this achieves its height. And as you can see, that this was once converging, is now uh, uh, neutral because uh, we've pulled it out to length. This can be done, this, this is not one of my pictures, but uh, it can be done to the compression distraction device off the synthes set. It can also do a similar effect and more people are using this. The other way you can do it is actually through the uh, lateral approach uh, where you can lever up uh, this area. Also, you can bring a small lever in uh, underneath uh, this area here into the fracture plane uh, to also lever and try and get your uh, medial column length. And then the KY is then placed up the medial column into the system tackle. So the sinus tarsal incision, so a few little caveats. Uh, the sural nerve is at risk. So as you can see, the sural nerve is coming around this position. There's also a branch coming up uh, towards the sinus tarsi. Uh, so they advocated that instead of having a, a linear incision going down towards the fifth, it should be a lot more parallel with the uh, plantar aspect of the foot to avoid this nerve. Uh, as you go in, your three windows are in front of your peris brevis, in between your peris longus, peris brevis, and behind peris longus. But in your window three, you just have to be very careful because the sural nerve, the main branch is definitely in, uh, um, uh, in the way here. So you can see the diff three different approaches. Often you don't need to go back this far, depending on what you're using. Obviously, you're using a plate, so sometimes you have to go a bit further back. Uh, as in this paper, I agree with them that what happens is that you have a lateral wall blow out and then your posterior facet often drops down into position. And uh, sometimes you have to uh, uh, retract the anterolateral wall to get to this position uh, because you do have a blind spot otherwise, as illustrated in this diagram. So as you can see, uh, a horizontal incision. This is what you usually see. Here's your posterior facet, here's your talus. And what you're trying to do is uh, match this posterior facet to this talus. Uh, to do this, you have to put a, a retractor underneath this posterior facet to elevate it. And then you key in this corner of your anterior process underneath this area. You can see it here that the posterior facet has been elevated. So this is a diagram of this. So you get your length of your tuberosity first. This gets you some space. And then by levering up, and then often there's a corner that you can match between these two. I'll give you an example of one of our cases. We can see that the corner has been matched here. 
the ones that extend all the way into the tuberosity are a little bit easier to, uh, to solve because you can compress the top bit and also elevate uh, this corner to uh, achieve your critical angle just saying. So you can see here, this is a, a typical example of this. We have a good uh, element of tuberosity below it, which is uh, useful. And this can be elevated, this can be compressed from the back. Another example of such uh, a case uh, here, unfortunately, we've got some comminution on the inferior aspect of the carcingum. You can see here this comminution and the uh, lateral wall blowout. And this is the uh, fragment of the posterior facet uh, to the extending to the posterior aspect of tuberosity. And we can see here that this has been uh, elevated, this has been compressed, and we achieve in our column lengths uh, with these two screws. Another example, very similar position where we got very uh, large amount of combination on the medial aspect and the inferior aspect of this calcaneum. Uh, the heel, as you can see, is a significant varus. And again, this screw is uh, maintaining uh, the heel into a neutral position. And then this has been used a small plate depth comminution to achieve the critical angle of just saying in the bonus angle. In salvage uh, cases, the rosty position uh, is key and the joint is not salvageable. In the case of my own, you can see a fractal dislocation of the tail less uh, virtually a non-existent calcaneum. On the CT, uh, 3D CT, we can see that this is an open injury on the medial aspect and this is uh, virtually uh, non-existent. Uh, You've got a sustain tackle, and that's the bit that you're going to try and get underneath. You're going to get the tailors in the right position, fix the uh, medium malleolus, but then you're going to try and get whatever two broths you have and just attach it to the calcaneum. I personally don't like using uh, graft in open fractures uh, as it's just another source of infection. And as you can see here, we've got, uh, after bringing in through the medial side, because quadratus planti is often uh, damaged and often the and nerve and blood vessel have to be uh, often repaired. And then we have uh, a maintenance of the tuberosity position. And this is in about a few months down the line. And as you can see that we've got uh, significant uh, disuse osteopenia, but we have the maintenance of heel alignment. So in summary, uh, decrease in wound infection with sinus tarsi, no difference in radiological outcomes. It's important to get the tuberosity length out uh, and out of varus and the sinus task approach uh, to control the posterior facet. Uh, thank you.